uh, in uh, creating this uh, program. And uh, I am very grateful for this opportunity and uh, getting involved. So I, uh, I, we have uh, lots of lectures to give. So I figured I'd just talk a little bit about IVC thrombectomy. Just, you know, as, I, as they say, picture is better than thousand words. So, you know, we had a video that we sent to AUA this year that was a condensed, more condensed version, but this one hopefully will be a little bit of a teaching material. And uh, obviously there is no expectation that one completes this lecture and goes to, uh, complete this lecture and goes to uh, start doing IVC thrombectomies, but just very briefly, it's a uh, old literature because all these incidents are well described. It's known that, you know, venous invasion, and we're talking about anything from you know, microvascular invasion, you can see that it's up to a third of patients. You can have IVC extension about 5% or so, and about 1% will go, uh, up to 1% will go into a uh, uh, atrium. When you look about, when you look at definitions and, uh, you know, there are many levels, or many types of definitions that are described uh, for the uh, IVC thrombectomy. And for example, you know, you depending on nomenclature, uh, you can hear about, you will hear about Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic, and you will hear about Europeans, but there are some very basic levels of definition, right? And according to Mayo, for example, if you go less than two centimeters into IVC, yeah, you have, uh, uh, this is level one, so pretty much renal vein and a little bit of a tongue sticking in, and that's a vast majority of the IVC thrombi. The level two is the one that is usually intraoperatively relatively simple, fun to do, open, robotic, laparoscopic, however you choose to do it. But those are relatively easy because they do not quite reach something as this. Any residents want to tell me what am I pointing out right here? What are those? What are those blue things? Come on, guys, get yourself off mute. Somebody say, Tata, are you quiet? I'm doing the lecture. I'm important to this. Okay, so, boys, easy there. Okay, anybody, any residents, do they, do, are you guys able to talk? Anybody? Hepatic talk? veins. Hepatic veins, that's right. So, as long as it's below, oh, Dr. Cogan is there. Hi, Dr. Cogan. So, no seeing patients. When it, when it reaches hepatic veins, then it becomes level three. And of course, it could be right to hepatic, could be right a little bit hepatic, but you can see between hepatic and the heart is a very small space. There is about two centimeters or so of cava, and you've got to be able to use that cava because that gives you your, uh, you know, that another 5% of cases or out of all the uh, IVC thrombi cases, and that's when it goes into atrium. So I just wanted to let you know. So when people talk infrahepatic, they usually talk somewhere here when they talk about it's a level three or, you know, close to diaphragm, you know, it's going to be here and these spaces are very tight. And then, of course, this is above the diaphragm. And by the way, we had the case one year ago, we did a case and it was actually in that supra diaphragmatic IVC. And we did the entire case through the abdomen and we actually did show our trauma surgeons how to get there without opening up a chest. And you can open up diaphragm, pericardium, and get to that level right without doing all this. So, IVC thrombus me me measurement. So, just because I'll show a few videos of robotic things, I just think that for majority, it still is a, a very selected group. And that's honestly, that's, that's honest, that's truth. Let's not be heroes, but I'll show you a couple of crazy cases, perhaps. So, level one, as I say, doesn't count. You know, you can staple across the vein. If you need to put a little Satinsky across and you're done, level two is okay. And those are the ones that are good, you know, for, for you kind of junior guys to learn. And then when you go to true level three, you need to Pringle, you need super hepatic control. Uh, and that's, that becomes as long and dangerous. And then of course, level four, uh, IVC, and we have done all of this, but level four robotically has not been done yet, although uh, uh, somebody has shown with the controlled piecemeal tumor removal, and it did not look any oncologic to me when you just start laparoscopically start pulling out tumor in the controlled piecemeal removal, as they said. So, 
there are, let me just go over a few th surgical principles for this uh, uh, tumor thrombectomy, and it's important, and I, I know I always talk about this plus minus hepatobiliary vascular cardiac surgery. I think it depends on experience. There are some centers where your cardiac people are very good and your vascular no and hepatobiliary, and in some centers you, you may be able to, you may be the one running the show, and it just depends on how much and where you have done those cases. So this is, I think, a very important principle that you've got to operate on vessel serum. You've got to, uh, and also you have to preserve collateralized vein if IVC is included, if uh, occluded because there are, as you understand, plenty of alternative blood uh, outflow from uh, anywhere, kidney or lower extremities that will need to get somehow to the heart, especially if the cava is occluded. So operate on vessel first is important because knock on the wood, I have not had, uh, well, I had near mortality, but I did not have a mortality on the table uh, uh, due to, and I certainly never had this embolization because I have no problem getting an early control and uh, I would take vessels first. So if you start doing all the good things like moving the kidney too much, uh, trying to do uh, uh, too much of a, a dissection around vein and seeing how things are pretty, that's when people get in trouble. So operate on vessels first. If there is one thing that you take from this lecture, it's not the stupid videos, but this principle that you've got to take care of, you know, you've got to get the cava you know, occlude it, and then you can you can you can uh, safely complete the vascular portion, and then you can do your nephrectomy and all that stuff. Don't do it the other way around. Don't do your nephrectomy, and just leave a little bit of a cava attached to the tumor thrombus, and then start to pull it out. By that time, that tumor thrombus is going to go north, and you're going to get your unfortunately settled embolism. So, like atrial artery, no need to embolize. That's another important principle, and isolate venous structure. So. You know, you all heard about superhepatic, infrahepatic control, and you all talk, you all hear about the control of renal vein. You got to completely remove the thrombus and manage any distal bland thrombus. When I say manage distal bland thrombus, you have many options. Sometimes you just have to ligate the cava, period. If you have too much of a, if you have too much of a thrombus below, uh, uh, the, the bland thrombus below your tumor thrombus, Sometimes your best IVC filter or best management is just ligate or divide the cava and be done with it because the last thing you want to do is send things up. If you don't want to do it, or for example, if you feel like this really was not a completely occluded, then you may have to put in a filter. And uh, sometimes you just have to start people on anticoagulation. But one thing you should not try to do is to pull this bland thrombus out just because it, it, it's going to be sticky, it's an organized thrombus, it's not going to work. Uh, I have tried all of them uh, uh, more than once, and I can assure you that, of course, if I can, if I can just ligate that cave, I do, uh, especially if it's been occluded for a while. The, those patients have uh, uh, those patients have uh, plenty of uh, 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 collaterals, uh, and they do fine. And you know, we have taken cave all the way up to hepatic veins with no issues. Repair patch replace IVC. That may be a whole lecture of itself. I won't spend too much on it. Um, you have to do what you have to do. Ideally, again, <laughs> as crazy as it may sound, if I can if I can take that cava out, I will. And if I can just oh, take the thrombus and repair it, of course, that's a preferable option. But then when you start going, and again, uh, you know, we we have here we've done the replacement. We've put in a bovine pericardium patch. We have placed in uh, IVC filters, so we do what we need to do. And, uh, you know, then after all this, after the vascular work is done, then you complete the nephrectomy. And then you do your lymph node dissection. And one of the reasons, once again, is do not send that thrombus up. So exposure is everything. I'm sure that present residents don't even understand, don't even know the name of this incision. Anybody knows what this incision is? Residents, I know Dr. Finn knows. Okay, Rikin, hockey stick, hockey stick, hockey stick. What are you, Canadian or something? Give me the name. This is a hockey bias comment. Thoracal abdominal, James Bellarmino. What the hell? Jamie Bellarmino is there? Is it a Bratislavski incision? 
How come James Murray? No, seriously, is that a joke? Jamie, Jamie Bellarmino? Okay, anyways. So, We're all trying so, to learn from you. Say it again? We are all trying to learn from you. I love it. Okay, anyways, this is thoracic abdominal. This used to be a good, nice, old incision. I did them with uh, Dr. Fisher quite a bit and with Kaufman. And, you know, we are now this is no need for it. We have real retractors. Obviously, this will be your, you know, Mercedes. This is your midlines. This is your Chevron Mercedes. You don't need to extend all that. But yeah, get a good exposure. There are a couple more points before I go and run through this video so I don't bore you to death with this boring lecture. But, you know, if you, there, there were a few studies and, you know, probably one of the largest ones was published that was uh, from a Cleveland when they looked at the IVC cases and they looked at like 135 with and 90 without embolization, preoperative embolization. And with embolization, they still had higher blood loss, complication, mortality, five-fold increase of perioperative death in patients with embolization. Ignore this box. It just, uh, it just got screwed up. And several large kiwis argue against embolization. Now, please remember that these are retrospective series. Sometimes people go and just do embolization because they are so afraid and they think they'll never get to that, to that uh, 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 renal artery. And unless you're a doctor thing with those fingers that I remember how he could just do the whole thing in like five minutes and get to those vessels. Uh, one thing I'll tell you that, you know, these are biased comparisons. Bias because we often identify those patients that were embolized just because they were so bad. But as of today, whatever retrospective series are, they do show that embolization does not help. I have never embolized. I don't have any plans. And quite frankly, partially because, you know, this is just one of the good examples you can usually get to it. Although this is a very nice exposure of a renal artery that, quite frankly, on these cases, sometimes you just don't get. I do think that people need to be aware of something known uh, in transplant as a piggy bag. You know, back at the NCI, I had the pleasure of living at, uh, in uh, Rockville, and the cost of living was so expensive that I had to moonlight at Fairfax Hospital. So I did quite a few liver transplants with liver guys. So this is a very standard, you know, mid right medial visceral rotation. My residents know that when we do it, we, we get that exposure. If we need to, you also know how we often do a complete left medial visceral rotation when we do uh, left-sided upper pole, big tumors or uh, 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 recurrences by diaphragm or adrenal masses. So this is an important concept to know because you can see, you know, you do have to take plenty of short hepatics and you'll see some anatomy shortly, but this is an important thing. And one of the reasons I showed this picture is because remember, when you're gonna have a high uh, a thrombus above the diaphragm, you can see the mouth moving, I hope. Uh, what you will see is that as soon as you can bring the thrombus below the liver, you can open up your uh, inflow into a liver. Uh, and then you can, uh, essentially allow uh, uh, for the, uh, you know, hepatic veins to finally drain. And this literally allows the, you know, your, your ischemia because on the Pringle, you drop a lot of preload from splanchnic circulation. And when you, when you Pringle and then you have to go suprahepatic control, the only fluid, the only blood that the uh, sir comes to a right atrium will be uh, from your, uh, you know, will be from your, hands and will be from your head and neck and that often is not enough and that's when you have to push anesthesia to do it as soon as you as soon as you bring the level of thrombus below whether this is with the foley or manually or whatever you literally convert a level four to level three and then this becomes a totally different surgery because patients become much more hemodynamically stable and i think it's important if you get this uh, uh this uh, uh steps so the, the the level three technique, what I just described, right, is this is your Pringle manure. Or this, this one is around the renal vessel. You will have your Pringle here. Uh, I do show, my residents very well know how to get into this uh, foramen of Winslow. Very easy to identify your porta hepatis here uh, when we do it. And uh, pretty much this, uh, these are the sequences, right? So ideal, you have to do control vein. You go distal IVC. When we say distal IVC, that's a wrong term.
but we should we should just go you know IVC that is most inferior and most superior. So distal IVC and then you do a Pringle, which is hepatic inflow, which is where your hepatic artery is, portal vein, as well as obviously common bile duct, but nobody separates them. It's very simple to do. And then you get the super hepatic IVC because you don't want to have all this blood flow going to the liver. And um, if you if you occlude super hepatically too early, because then you will have you know, massive congestion and you can literally lose, you know, easily three to 500 cc's more just because you did not do bottom up. And then remove thrombus if you, and expect, or get it below the hepatic veins. And that's what I talked earlier. So you try to bring this thrombus below hepatic veins. You can, uh, uh, you know, you can then occlude the IVC below. And then by doing so, you can release your Pringle and then all the blood from gut and liver and splenic circulation will go into a heart and patient will be hemodynamically stable. Uh, so then you can repair a vena cava leisurely because remember, once it's below the, the hepatic veins, you're safe. You really are safe because you really have uh, all the flow and there are a lot of my patients who walk around without cava all the way to this, to this level. And then you can go ahead and complete uh, and complete nephrectomy. So for the level four technique, of course, you can do vena venous, cardiopulmonary, or hypothermic cardiopulmonary, and that's technically or any cardiopulmonary bypass should go with the hypothermia. You know, it, that's yes, it gives you bloodless field, it gives you a lot of ischemia time, but you do need. You know, it, it's been shown that the longer you allow this to do, you have, you know. Uh, uh, hospital stay and uh, you know, and also need for anticoagulation reversal. Um, I have a colleague. I know that you, some of you have met uh, Dr. Uh, Matveev from uh, uh, former uh, from Moscow, and I know that they really have completely abandoned this and their transabdominal technique. That you know, I I personally adapted as well. With that transabdominal technique, you avoid the need for stenotomy and a lot of the cardiopulmonary bypass, unless it's really far, far into the atrium. So this is just a good example of a tumor thrombus in the atrium, and then reconstruction, right? So the whole point is, the whole point is complete removal of intraluminal thrombus, as well as tumor infiltrating the renal wall, uh, you don't, uh, 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 IVC wall. The last thing you want to do is do a nice surgery and then not get either negative, negative margins or at least not not remove the tumor completely, right? So sometimes it's very hard to recognize grossly. So it's sometimes you gotta do frozen section. Patch is preferred over graft if possible. Well, one of the reasons is because with the bone pericardium patch, you really don't need to anticoagulate them. And you already are using a little bit of a, you know, a native strip of a cava. So you, you kind of have your lay uh, of the land, but again, if needed to, you can graft it. That's also not an issue. So, I already discussed the fact that you can do intrarenal IVC resection without replacement if vein is chronically included. So, please don't hesitate uh, uh, to, to, to consider it as long as you get your right renal vein draining somewhere. And please, if you can get your resection of IVC intrarenal, you will unlikely have any effects. Just got to get your patients ready. You know, if they need stockings, they may know, they should know that they're going to swell up for two, three weeks, but they all, all, all uh, uh, develop uh, co collaterals. Uh, only, only extremely rare. Now, this comes from trauma literature and uh, in uh, testicular, you know, the, the cavas are, uh, have been sacrificed forever, and I don't know why the kidney guys have not been adapting it, but... Only very, very occasionally, if you take cava and then you take a lot of circulation, you can actually have uh, devastating consequences of, uh, you know, inability to drain the lower extremity uh, and uh, from uh, uh, occlusive, literally occlusive process. Because if you if you not only take cava but you take the new collaterals, then it becomes a problem. And then, um, as I as I said, replacement suprarenal IVC with low threshold to reimplant renal veins. I have never reimplanted renal vein on the left side. Uh, I have done quite a few where I just ligated renal vein. These are inconsequential. There are plenty of blood supply that will drain 
left renal gain. Uh, any of the residents can want to quickly share uh, what the blood supplies are for the left renal vein? So how the left kidney will drain if I were to ligate left renal vein by the IVC? Any residents? It's okay, it can be interacted. Um, adrenal and gonadal. Who said that? Oh. You have a name? Vikas and Dr. Kaufman. Ah, very nice. So adrenal, gonadal, and then any, any other one? Left side. Dr. Mian is typing for you guys. Dr. Mian, you're going to lose your points for cheating, for making your resident cheat. Okay, Dr. Mian's answer was Lampa, and he's correct. So the bottom line is, bottom line is you absolutely, I never had to have reimplant left renal vein. This is inconsequential. On the right side, you've got to do it. I've done, I've tried to do some jumps with gonadal. I've tried to do this. You've got to reimplant through left renal vein. So if you have to take a little bit uh, of a risk and just bring it somewhere, bring it anywhere, bring it to another big vein and just drain it, but you will not be able to allow a kidney to survive. It will not go retrograde through gonadal or if you bring an adult to a, a, a portion of it. Okay, so let me see if I can move this down. Okay, good. So this was a good example. This was a case here at Upstate, for example, he had this nastiness. You see a little bit of a bland thrombus, but he had this thing. And essentially you can literally, you, you know, this was a case I did the small cavarvi, put in the pole and just brought it literally, brought it right below diaphragm. So so this way we could maintain this uh, from a level four to level three. And also, you know, at some point we recognized that this cable was involved. So this whole thing went, but this portion of the cable was open. So he leaves, and I have a few actually that live with a couple of uh, 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 hepatic veins, no IVC, and they do just fine. They do just fine. Okay. Another point for residents, I think it's important. I know the literature is old, but the point is here that uh, this is the survival that you need, you can easily uh, uh, hope for, right? So you're looking at about 50% of patients. I know as crazy as it is, it's IVC involvement, these tumors are showing billions of cells a minute, but as you can see, uh, the five year disease specific survival is actually quite high. At the same time, this is an ideal population for adjuvant trials, right, for renal cell carcinoma. So just, just remember this number, that at five years, 50% will survive. So when those people come and they have this huge tumor thrombus and they think that they're almost dead, you tell them that they still have much better odds than those with pancreatic or, you know, esophageal and so many. So, you know... This is a kind of a somewhat of a contemporary uh, uh, contemporary baseline for those that undergo open uh, uh, surgery. This is the 162, kind of a very high level thrombi, 69, and you see complications in about a third, about 10% die. And I do think that it's important that we give honest, you know, mortality rates to those you know, uh, and the honest complication rates who undergo uh, this type of surgery because those are indeed quite morbid and very, very challenging. So very quick on this quote unquote didactic portion before I go into video presentations, if you guys are interested, um, you know, I, the vessel first approach. I don't know if uh, Margaret already distributed the quiz, but I will have no problem saying that vessels first, first, first. As soon as you can get a safe control of IVC above, below, contralateral, and control the renal artery, just go do the vessel first, then complete your nephrectomy. They play around. And then do your dissection. Uh, experienced multi-D teams can assure low morbidity mortality. I have to make that statement because that's the right thing to do. Don't be a hero. Sometimes I, I lose my uh, uh, reason when I do things. And then... You know, the beauty about uh, 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 minimally invasive is that 
you can offer a still anatomy free approach and there is a potential always for a minimal invasive surgery although i really haven't showed too much that on minimal invasive surgery uh, there will be three cases that i you know uh, we've made the videos for aua as i mentioned that these are kind of slightly more extended versions uh, these are the three challenging i should say case from our state uh, from anywhere from extirpation to a uh, replacement of the cava the, done robotically. So one is a beast woman with 11 centimeter IVC thrombus. Then this one, the second one was a T4 RCC with liver invasion and IVC thrombus. And this was a uh, and recurrent ICC with direct invasion requiring time. So these are kind of the first three in the literature that, you know, one is already published like this was, you'll see this case. As you can see, this is a, a, a case of uh, very high tumor thrombus. You can see a filling defect within the cava. Um, you can see the, the tumor goes all the way up, but likely it's a free floater because you see blood around and you can see it goes all the way to the hepatic, uh, hepatic veins and it measures about 11 centimeters here. She was large, you know, she went home in like 36 hours, quite frankly, because we lost an IV and she was already drinking. So, you know, I, you, we, we tried to get IV 20 times and I said, let her go home. And uh, after that, everybody goes home soon. Uh, how did she get in the MRI uh, is a good question. <laughs> she, she, somehow we, you know, put some oil, or olive oil on her and just squeezed her in a little bit. So that would have been a good question. And then that's how she looked. And then, of course, we got on the cover of urology and this is our little show off mode. So. Uh, at this point, let me first do the following. Do people have any questions uh, on the quote-unquote didactic portion? Because I don't want it to be just a big monologue. I, don't, I think everybody has camera. No, actually, some people have camera. Right. Okay. Is, is there Dr. Kaufman there? Hey, Dr. Kaufman. Derek Friedman. Derek. You started residency already? Okay. So uh, okay, should I uh, should I go ahead? There's a question in the chat um, about frozen sections when you're doing a robotic case. What's your strategy for performing the frozen? Same same as open, because what would you do open, right? You would send the frozen close up. So uh, you know, it's it's rare that you think you need it, but in some cases you'll see. In some cases, when things are when things are unpleasant, you just go ahead and uh, cut it out. You know, there is a very good Dr. Coleman's expression: "When in doubt, cut it out." Well, he actually was going more like dissect it out, but then became modified version of Dr. Coleman's teaching. But they, I think the same principles. I think they're the same. And can you comment a little bit about tumor spillage, if that um, has any oncological repercussions or otherwise? So, knock on the wood, this, you know, the, the, the ones that I have done, they don't have uh, any different tumor spillage than uh, open. Because if you think even when you do open, you still do vascular work first, and then you put in a little lap, right, to cover the tumor thrombus. And uh, that's about it. So we we try to do the same thing here, uh, you know, to prevent, you know, to prevent uh, tumor spillage. I, you know, so I can't. Uh, so I have to be honest. I had one patient who died after a partial nephrectomy that had negative margin. I kept looking at the video. There was a little portion of a what I would say, maybe what I thought was kind of juice, you know, or like just fat. It wasn't too invasive into fat. Margins were negative. The tumor was invasive into fat, but who knows? But I ended up, I ended up, unfortunately, having to go back three times to clean up his metastatic sites, uh, you know, local, uh, local invasive site. But I, I be honest, those things happens open too. Those things happen open too. And but the pattern of his of metastatic disease for this gentleman was all kind of an irate right pericolic gutter. So I don't know, I took like 
five, six, seven nodules, abdominal wall, uh, mat, and you know he's uh, he's you know he's done well for many years. The what got him was like about two months afterwards he had already mat in the spleen, mat in the kidney, contralateral way inside. So I don't know if you know if this was my spillage, but you know partials worry me sometimes more. If you think about the tumor spillage. You know, just think about tumor spillage process. When you have an IVC thrombus, this is an ultimate tumor spillage. You have tumor cells, you have the actual tumor being bathed by little or little of uh, blood that goes right through. I hope that makes sense. Do you guys, do you guys want to watch, uh, do you guys want to go over this? Uh, three eight minute videos. You're gonna go ahead. Three or maybe two depends on how long those are. But let's start it. Yeah, okay. So uh okay well I don't know which uh which one is I'll try to maybe fast forward this a little bit on some of these options. Okay, I don't know, Does that, do you hear music there, narration or anything like that? It's okay, you know what, I'll just narrate it. So I'll try to move this along. Uh, so this was a case that came in, this was the case that I showed you, this 11 centimeter, 52. She is a very large woman, as you can see. And uh, uh, this pretty much, you, you saw this, this is already a retrohepatic region of the IVC, so it's a, you know, it's kind of coming to, and this is where we put in this port. I mean, this was before the, uh, uh, we had X size, this is an S size. So this is pretty much camera robotic. Uh, it's somewhat of a, a crappy quality video, but we'll try to figure this out. So anyways, so this one is, uh, you can see a large uh, mass. I'm just trying to look around, pretty bad quality, I think. At least it transmit badly. This is duodenum. Uh, being uh, cockerized. In a, in a minute, I'll show you better quality videos, I promise. So this is the, you, yeah, this is, I guess, I don't know, is it projecting as bad for you guys, for some reason, to the Webex, but can you see it at least? Looks good. Okay, good. So this is the renal artery. Thank you. This is a renal vein. The good news about this tumor was that uh, uh, the good news was that we knew that the uh, this was likely a free floating, and you could see it on the ultrasound. And when you deal with the free floating, you kind of get everything ready. By the way, this is short hepatics. You can ligate them just, uh, you know, those go to coated lobe of the liver. You know, you just keep marching up all the way high. You do need a little bit of a thing. This, 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 you know, she had some huge short hepatics. Eventually we'll be able to cut it. Yeah, it looks extremely bloody. We lost like, a, I believe we lost like a good, Little, a little more of blood than this. If any questions type or write, you probably understand what we're doing. These are just, I don't think, I don't do any more of this uh, uh, loops, vascular control. This is old stuff, totally unnecessary. Right now, I just put bulldogs and be done with this. This is like, this is pornography trying to do this stupid vessel loops around this cave. As somebody came up with this, you know, you have laparoscopic bulldogs, just plop it up and you'll be done, quite frankly. You know, I, but, but we did it, you know, it was like 2000, whatever, 14 or 15. It was like five years ago, but this was high. This is control renal vein, as you can see with bulldog. So if you have, if you don't occlude it above, it spits that tumor out in your face, okay? And I think that's also important to know. When you can have a very high tumor, but if you don't have a perfect, you know, if you don't have one, if you don't close above completely, 
I recently uh, uh, was at the conference and the Chinese guys were doing this laparoscopic and that's pretty much what they do. They close below and that's it. And you can see this puppy is just spit out. It's a long thrombus. But if you don't close it up, at this point, I probably should have closed. But what we have is at this point, you literally just amputate it. And you have this huge, huge, huge thrombus that is a free floater, but you allow this to, to spit out. So the, 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 this, is, this is boring, right? This is, uh, you can see I'm using silk. You're going to say why? Uh, quite frankly, it's because they, what they, that's what they gave me. I asked for a 2-0 or something stitch or a 3-0. And it's perfectly fine. I know that to everybody, and I know you'll see, I'll use proline in the other video or whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, uh, I know that it's prothrombogenic. There is no silk inside the lumen anyway, so who cares? And uh, if you think people haven't closed IV, I put the stitches with, uh, with uh, what is this thing? Uh, with Vicryl, you can, you can use it too. Of course, for your boards, please. Make sure you tell your exam, and this is your removing now contral or renal vein uh, bulldog. And at this point, by the way, you know, if you remember, I only had kind of suspended the kidney a little bit. It's not that big of a tumor itself, but, you know, it, it had a relatively large, it had a relatively large uh, long tumor thrombus. So um, at this point, this is just RPL and D, you know. Again, now the literature, if you look at the literature, back in 2015, there was not even a question this was the right thing to do, a lymph node dissection. But recently, May put out their paper, uh, Boris Gorshman is a first author, a couple of years ago, when they did, uh, uh, the, when they looked, it looks like lymph node dissection may not have much of a, a role anymore, even for a higher stage tumors. To me, it was quite you know, quite frankly, a surprise. I certainly still do it aggressively for transitional cell carcinoma, but for renal cell carcinoma, you know, at, at this time, I, I was positive I was doing the right thing. So these are lymph nodes along the, you know, pre-cable area, pre-cable, and this is a peri-cable, but I'll, I'll end up stripping the entire cava towards the end of the case. And then, you will see that this is the interiority cable area that is going. I know the quality is not the quote unquote high def, but it's okay. It's somewhat usable. You at least understand. And then, you know, make sure you get your lymphostatic control. This is uh, towards the interiority cable. So, in this case, we did take quite a few nodes, but you can see at this point, this cava is stripped. This is below the renal vein. You can see that's all stripped out. This is a contral renal vein. You can see this is suprahyalur as well and pretty much all set. So this is a completed product. The cava is closed all the way up here. And then we did the yeah, 1200. We, we gave a blood, you know, but uh, we got, uh, I believe, over 40 nodes. Uh, for this case, and uh, yeah, she went home in 36 hours. She had no complications, still alive. About a year ago, she developed few small pulmonary mats. She still has not had any systemic therapy. So grade three negative margin, uh, and then bunch of lymph nodes, 44 in this case. So I'll stop at this one. I'll go to my second video because I don't want to keep it mass much past you know, five o'clock or something like that. So let me just keep going. And then maybe after we review these videos, uh, maybe after we review them. So this was a 47 with hematuria 12 centimeter. And imaging was suspicious for invasion of a liver, abdominal sidewall. And as you can see, this enormous, enormous uh, thing going kind of into a sidewall. And then in a second, you will see I had a high suspicion that it was in the liver. I was right, but that's not that difficult, right, to appreciate that that's straight into a liver. Often these right-sided masses push into a liver. And then we got more imaging, and then we also saw that there was a small renal uh, IVC thrombus, but this is certainly uh, a thing. So I did this whole thing, 
I quite frankly initially asked our liver guy to help me with livery section uh, because I, I wasn't supposed to. And uh, but when the patient ended up being in uh, blank, he he really wasn't comfortable doing livery section uh, uh, in flank with the robot. So you know, so we 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 just did it. So we're putting an ultrasound. You can clearly see using ultrasound. You can demarcate. So this is segment six. If anybody wants to play with delivery section, start with segment six. It's uh, the your easiest one. Uh, you can demarcate it. You can buzz until the liver starts bleeding like uh, crazy. And then when it starts bleeding, you know you can literally just run a few roll of staples through. And then again on the T four, get your get your liver away. Get your liver away. So do your liver part. Okay, don't do your liver part. You have your hepatobiliary guys do your liver part. And then just staple away whatever you want to staple because that piece of liver was involved and it was obviously limiting any mobility uh, of the liver. And in order for you to do IVC case, you need to be able to take this right triangular ligament enough to be able to... Uh, if you guys see anything brown, there is or or like pieces of yellow. This is just liver parenchyma. There, there is no. Uh, uh, the, so this was bloody. I have to be honest. But it, you know, you just pack it. Don't look at it, and you go somewhere else. So this is now kidney. At this point, now the delivery is gone. Now you can go ahead and quickly, you know, complete your bowel mobilization. This, as you can see, has this uh, moist planes as you. As you can see, they're kind of sweaty. You know that that's probably like either sarcoma or sarcomatoid. Uh, but you can see like this tissue almost. Sometimes it's helpful that it hydrodicides, but it's also sticky. Uh, and at this point, you just march all the way on the IVC. But the fact that your liver is free, you know, gives you an opportunity to, you know, come and work on your cava. And at least you can retract liver high enough. This is... Uh, as you can see, we're going to be coming. This is short hepatics. Again, as I, can, as I showed you earlier, a lot of the short hepatics in this patient. So what you want to do is you really got to get that caudate lobe away. Once you get that caudate lobe away, you can see all of a sudden this retro, retro hepatic cable opening up. In this case, yeah, I just, you know, you just, you just, you just click and then uh, uh, I identify. If you noticed, because I did not have artery done, I placed a clip above the hilum first just because I did not want any of this manipulation to send the thrombus up. So I just put in a clamp up, people can tolerate it, one can appreciate the thrombus inside. This is, so this is totally done in a unconventional fashion, but I was so afraid the last thing I want to do is send thrombus inside. So you could see I got a soup, you know, I got a, a proximal cava first or the one that is by the heart and then you can do your cavotomy and that is usually not an issue it's a sizable thrombus at the end of the day but it doesn't go that high uh, most importantly for me was that this thing doesn't fall out and doesn't you know fly away to the to the uh to the heart and obviously at this point after you resect you see there was a little bit of a thick ivc wall i don't recall if I ended up taking a little more, but you can trim, keep trimming cava until it gets better. This time I'm closing with a uh, uh, with the proline. So this one is, uh, I think, a good example of uh, you know this. So this was the beauty of this case, or the challenge of this case was uh, that liver was plastered. And again, don't forget to bleed out. Right when you have the final hole left, you know you could see how I just flash this cava, and only then you go to complete the nephrectomy. If you recall, in this case, this patient did have a uh, uh, invasion of, uh, did have an invasion of the sidewall. So the only way to do it is just go all the way, all the way until the, the, you have nothing. And if there is a muscle involved, you take it. And if not, in this case, I was lucky. I was able to stay right literally into diaphragm or almost to diaphragm. And you will see, I split, I did literally, it's called peritoneal stripping. It's something that you learn from uh, uh, oncologists. You know, this is, what is it, ureter, I guess, and then lower pole gyrotus. But, and you were just trying to get that plank away from the posterior wall. So this peritoneal stripping you do with oncologists, 
or you see them do for like mesothelioma or something. And then you will see once we're done, you literally can do and you take parietal peritoneum along with all the fat and everything off. So in this case, we were lucky that while it was invasive into a wall, we were able to literally stay without damage to diaphragm. You can clearly see that this is a naked diaphragm. There are, there are no fibers, no nothing. At uh, this point, we're just gonna carry this. You'll see a final result shortly. And usually you don't see that many diaphragmatic fibers, but you know, this is, this is your view, right? This is your liver done. And you can see your whole diaphragm uh, completely stripped and the sidewall completely stripped. Okay, so the, and this is liver. You can see it does stop bleeding. So this patient, patient also went home on day two and also had no, and he was sarcomatoid. And you could probably predict sarcomatoid by the way it looked. And then he, he, he has no evidence of recurrence. So that's another one. And let me just give you one final interesting since I uh, was planning to do. So this is with the cable replacement case. So I did his partial. I kid you not, I did his partial in 2012. He had grade three or he ended up, uh, and, uh, and, and three. And then this is what I have. All of a sudden, six years later or so, all of a sudden on the imaging, I see this big Goomba. And that big Goomba, you know, that big Goomba was uh, very, very unpleasant. This is already reoperative field. Obviously, I was very concerned for duodenum. I was concerned for cava. I knew it was reoperative surgery, so I knew that it doesn't matter how and where one would do it, it's going to be nasty. So there is no, so you can see your large bowel, you peel away, but then you're going to start seeing these numerous, numerous adhesions and duodenum and this, you know, all these parasites. Like, look at all these parasites. This, you know, this is a very, look at these snakes. That is night inside of the wall, but literally I didn't know what I was doing other than I knew I just need to cut them off somehow, pack and just keep going. And of course, at some point we peeled off the adenum. You can see a little bit of a messed up cirrhosis. We just kind of brought it together. And then we do ultrasound. And when you do ultrasound, you say, what is this? It's inside, but this is cable wall. This is outside and the inside. You can see, you kind of start to see tumor from both sides. So all of a sudden I'm starting to think, whoa, Maybe this is not IVC thrombus. Maybe this is direct invasion. And those are the scary guys because those are the ones where, you know, if you're not ready, then you're in trouble. So this is an aorta site. We just took a renal artery. This is where did it into aorta cable because going back in that mass was impossible. So in this case, we literally had to go to aorta. And uh, you can see the, the, there was a contral renal vein that you can see right here, right? You can see renal vein on the left, to the going to the left, right here. This is see a lot of the cava, plenty of cava above, right? When we know that the, the mass was kind of, in, kind of in the middle. And then of course you get this, yeah. And then this is just to get some sort of a control of a cava. And now you're starting to appreciate that this thing is literally, um, you know, we're just isolating it, vessel loops, that's fine. But then you're starting to appreciate that this thing is encroaching towards the uh, renal vein on the left. So that's how I manage renal vein. You can see, I just took it, we just divide it, and that's okay too. And I was hoping that I will be able to just open this up and then, re re you know, just close up this cava. And you can see this tumor. But what's scary part is you can see another guy, and this is the hilum. So this is the osteum of the right side. So this tumor actually is growing through and through from behind. So I thought that I would be able to do it and then patch it. But then we saw this guy, another tumor. So you have these fingers, projections, you know, coming all over in different portions of the cava. So at this point, there was no reason to hang on to that cava. So we cut it below. We cut it above, you know, and we just completed nephrectomy. And of course, at this point, Cable is in total discontinuity. And if you recall, he did have thrombus, but he didn't have a complete occlusion. And because I didn't want to be dealing with, uh, he's a young guy, he plays basketball, 
you know, so this is his thing. And then you measure defect. And one thing I did not take into account how much it retracted. So we put in this graph. This is a little troubleshooting there as well. You know, this is proline. So I'm doing this. Uh, unfortunately, our vascular surgeons don't use robots, so that that was not good. But you know, I I wasn't going to torture him and you know uh, to torture the guy with the big incision because it would would have not mattered. You know. So, anyways, so after we did this, what we call uh, you know the proximal anastomosis or the or the, the superior anastomosis, I will not flash on it, but it's really not pushing back that much with. Uh, you know, with the graph, the, you know, it's really, while well, it's, it's the Senate. So I wasn't sure what the problem was. So we looked inside this graph, there is some very sluggish blood flow. So I figured, okay, maybe we'll just fill it up, put it behind because people haven't done this before. So I wasn't sure which end to do first. Now I know for sure that I will do the bottom end first. There is no question I would do a bottom end first because it always flows from the bottom so much better. But in this case, you open, by the way, it doesn't matter. Open, it totally doesn't matter. So as you can see here, we're completing this anastomosis from below. This is bubbling out. I want again, notice you want to make sure all the blood comes out. And then you see this curved, unpleasant looking graft. And I wasn't happy. And take a look at the blood flow, very sluggish. So that's a clot. That's a sluggish flow. That's a trouble. So I, I did... Uh, 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 superior anastomosis first, again, there is no textbook on how to do it because, as I mentioned, that hasn't really been done before. So at this point, we just say, hell with this, we're just going to, we're just going to open this up and uh, redo the uh, proximal anastomosis because this was a redundant graft. You can already see clot. So that was disaster waiting to happen. So we'll certainly have to flush that clot. And uh, you see, this is this is a portion of the graph. So at this point, you just flush it from below. You know, luckily when you have an assistant who, can, who you trust, you can just say open and close, open and close. But this thing needed to go. This thing needed to go. And then after this puppy went, you know, then you still have plenty of cave to anastomosis too. And then of course you, you only see portions and then we end up, you know, you have to fill this up with the heparinized saline or at least saline or something. And then we ended up redoing the anastomosis of this. Now, and remember, remember, you remember those clots, right? They continue to form. So anytime anybody is close in the final hole on the IVC, let it bleed. Let it bleed a little bit. I mean, this is not that much of a bleeding, quite frankly. But you've got to let it bleed, and you've got to let it... Uh, you know, kind of back bleed, but that's okay because you want to flush out all the air and you want to flush out all the, uh, you know, all the uh, uh, air as well as clots. So I will take extra a couple of hundred cc blood loss. At this point, you can open this up and then this is a, you know, a completion of the graft. Yeah, extra graft is removed. As you can see, that was not accounted for. And now you can see your cava, your graft, Put a little homemade stuff or whatever this thing. So he went home on day two. I did give him Lovinox, uh, and then he had 0, 30 notes. And then take a look at his post-operative imaging. This is Kava, 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 Kava. So it was good enough to fool radiologists because they said aorta and IVC within normal limits. So obviously they didn't know or I didn't figure that out. So he looked good. So okay, so I'm gonna stop this thing. I don't know if anybody can still, if anybody is still there, uh, but at this point, so I think it was important just to uh, share the craziness we do, but also uh, some of the things that we could potentially be uh, uh, doing, but have to be very, very selective. So I'll stop here. I'll ask uh, uh, if there are questions. I know we're coming for five minutes before five, so I think time wise is okay. The questions are yours now, guys.
after me and you type something, but I, I didn't see what you typed. Say it again. Or speak up. Badar. Or Daniel Finn. Thank you, Dr. Finn. That's very kind of you. Can you guys still hear me? I feel like I'm doing a monologue. Dr. Mian says yes. Dr. Fisher. Say something. I'm trying to type, but I'm saying outstanding work. You make me very proud. It looks okay, right, Dr. Fisher? Where's Dr. Coffin? Um, he's around somewhere. He's probably not on video. I'm not on video today. You're not. Oh, but I'm right here. Great work, Gennady. Uh, but you can, could you see Dr. Fisher? You are not on video, but could you see the video? Oh, yeah, I could see everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Corgan. Question was oops, I missed it. Something about pressure. What pressure to use on the pneumoperitoneum when you're doing all this? Business? Always place 50 at 20 for the port placement, drop it to 15 and go at 15. But you're right, it may be. Uh, I I agree. It, you know, if I don't know, ideally, probably want to do it at ten. You want to do it as low as you can, but you know, thank God, so far so good. I think as long as you always are cognizant about the air embolus on top of everything, because you know, I kept saying clot embolus, I kept saying about air embolus, but air embolus, I think, is a very real thing. Um, we had the one case. I wasn't in the room yet when you know. Uh, one of a very good residents uh, ended up putting a, you know, various into a cava and, um, you know, gave a little bit of a pulmonary, uh, pulmonary uh, embolus. And that was, uh, you know, rapidly recognized by anesthesia. We stopped insufflation, um, you know, and uh, I had to literally, you know, we ducked in the robot. We saw a little hematoma, pulled out that various, and uh, certainly it was in the IVC. So, but the question is, at which point can the air embolism occur? I don't know. I, I truly don't know. I think that this may be just one unlucky day and it will go. But as long as you continue in a cave closed, certainly that nothing propagates up. And as long as you keep flushing all the clots, all the air, I think that looks okay. There was another question in the chat about if you order any additional imaging studies, to assess for uh, collateral flow um, before you resect the IVC, or do you just go with the standard uh, maybe yeah, so, urogram so or something? You know, guys, you know when the IVC is not. You know, usually MRV or MR at least will give you a, a it will give you a re reasonable knowledge when the IVC is uh, clued. So you know that you are dealing with this. You know poor, poor flow through the IVC. So if you can avoid, you know, if, if you can avoid, uh, 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 you know, taking down all the collaterals, you know, take, uh, leave them alone. You know, if in the beginning, I was so proud that I would take all the lumbers until I had a guy with a enormous congestion. And then I, you know, sometimes I just wonder why. So if you can leave some uh, collaterals, leave them, leave them. They they will go through this azygous system. God knows where they go. Uh, some go will go through the skin, but who cares? If you can but there is nothing to assess. Dr. Goldberg, I saw you asking a question, and I'm sorry, I was talking and I did not uh, catch it. Hanan, speak up. It's okay. These are all. Dr. Goldberg is one of our uh, urologic oncologists. Amazing video. I just wanted to know, within a, in an open case, which I have seen a few, it's always an exposure problem. How do you deal with that robotically? There's no, there's no problems. Any special tips? Uh, exposure for what? For the liver. When you do liver resection, you go inside. They always have some difficulty in the exposure of the liver, special retractor. It's uh, how do you deal with that when you do this robotically? Yeah, so I take, so uh, first of all, certainly you have, there is a certain point, right? When you can't relieve, uh, take liver anymore. But you take right lateral triangular ligament 
high towards the bare area of the diaphragm. So the liver attack on the right, you know, everybody is just usually putting in their little retractor, gets a piece of a diaphragm and just lifts it up. I think the key here is to literally incise this right triangular ligament, high, high, high. And then you can always readjust your, uh, uh, your liver retractor uh, to do it. Yes, and that, so Dr. Fisher is asking about the ultrasound. So, so, but you're right, Hanan. I don't want you to think that uh, I don't want you to think that it's a cheap shot. But at least you could see, right? I wasn't stitching anywhere under. This was all in my face. And what also helps, you know, remember when we do open, liver is kind of uh, trying to flop on your face, but although open, you still get a very good, you know, exposure. Another thing is. Do not hesitate. Take as many short hepatics if, as you need to. That gets that corridor up. That gets the liver up, up and above and away. Did I answer your question, Hanan? Or at least try to. Yes. Yes. Great. Then Thank Dr. You. Fisher would you, would you asked if I monitor ultrasound. Yeah. So first of all, for open cases, no question. PE for level three thrombus and at least have a cardiac on, a, on a standby for level two, level three, just in case. And when I say cardiac, cardiac anesthesia. You know, cardiac surgery only on a kind of a supra hepatic uh, cases. That's when, you know, we prep the groin and then we get ready. Uh, for the ultrasound monitoring, every case should, I, I personally think it's very important where to cross clamp that cable. Uh, so it's extremely important to have this cava uh, be ready, uh, the, but also be cross clamped above the humor trauma. So ultrasound is always introduced and uh, always works uh, and always shows you, you know, is this a free flow? Is this attached? You know, uh, how far? So just gives you a little bit of a, a roadmap. All right, thanks, Nadi. Great talk. Uh, okay. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Cheng, good to see you. Thank you so much. Mehdi, thanks for coming. Mike, Rakesh, Mark. <laughs> Boy, all these good looking guys. Guys, Mahmoud, anyways, thank you all. Uh, uh, very touched by, uh, by, by such a group. Thanks, Gennady. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, guys. Gennady. Talk soon. Thank you, Gennady. Thanks, guys.